I'm back in California suddenly, staying on my friend's CNC 33, which he kindly let me anchor out in Richardson Bay. Because, let's face it, renting a place or staying in an Airbnb is unaffordable for a transient like me. It's a great little pad, and the commute to land is an intrepid kayak across the small channel to one of the many busy marinas lining the Sausalito shore. Robbie and I, of course, lived in Sausalito for several months while rigging our previous sailboat. So not only do I feel at home by being on a CNC, suitably named Joie de Vivre, but it's also pleasant to be back in the familiar environment of sights and sounds particular to the Bay Area. Recent changes by the city have made it so all but some certain boats have to anchor on the more shallow side of the channel. So I'm anchored in a spot where, at least half of the day, Little Joie is nestled nicely in some soft mud. So the tide's supposed to come up around, or be at its highest around noon or 1 p.m. While I wait for the tide to come up, I familiarize myself with the boat, see if she's sailable, while decrusting some clamps and clutches and raising the mainsail, which apparently could use some lubrication. Doing a bit of electrical work on this boat. We've got the cheap little solar charge controller. We have an older uh, face of some sort of electrical related device that had a hole to the batteries, directly to the batteries. So I'm just gonna swap them out. Solar charge controller is a lot more useful for me right now. Here we have it from the back. I'm basically wanting to clean up these wires. I'm going to try and follow them and take them out and leave as much um, of them intact just in case because this isn't my boat so I don't want to break stuff. WD-40 on these wire cutters might have also made the task easier but hey you've seen Robbie and I do electrical wiring before it's not always pretty. With all the end bits stripped, I'm ready to attach all the business tips, leaving all the live connections until last, meaning attaching the solar panel and the battery last so that I don't zap myself. This may seem super obvious to electrical people types, but as a person who has never wired anything on my own, it was a light bulb moment. <laughs> So lastly, as I said, to complete the circuit, I would simply be wiring the solar panel to the controller and the controller to the salvageable battery, very carefully making sure not to touch any positives to negatives accidentally. So immediately after putting all that together and placing the panel on the deck, like magic, I've got the battery taking in some free sun juice. A little while later, the voltage number is looking a little more robust and I feel a little better about playing around with the various electronics, knowing that the battery bank is actively being replenished with all this nice sunshiny weather. There's actually a little fish going by! It gives me more confidence to try starting the motor as well, knowing that I won't kill the battery completely on the first try. I docked extra slowly and carefully while making my way to the pump-out station, burrowed all the way inside a tight corner of a nearby marina. Once in there, it was just a matter of pressing the green button and opening the valve over the waste through deck fitting. I also filled up on fresh water here. Hooray! The problems with anchoring out here. Part one. If you don't have the right gear, it's not gonna work. Somebody must have gone over uh, with their prop. This was all that's on board. Maybe we'll have to buy some chain for this boat. Either the owner or, or me. This happened in the first 
three days or so. I'm lucky I pulled up uh, the anchor to go to the fuel dock and the pump out because, yeah, I wouldn't have noticed that. Right away you come in, you have a good galley. I like having the sink closer to where you step in at the door because the sink, if you get any dust or stuff coming in as you come in the companion way, you just brush it into the sink. Chart table, radios, and a little berth down in there. Not too bad. Although if you're tall, you probably hit your head. Your good old-fashioned layout of saloon and a little table. We ended up taking the table, out, the equivalent out in my way. Toilet area. And a V-berth that's reasonably sized, in my opinion. Not the smallest, not the biggest, just reasonable. Solar power little vent above the toilet. A hatch that keeps itself open. The propane stove is functional, although one, uh, one of these valves needs to be fixed a little bit. You take out the toolbox. Then you remove the step. And my friend has done a good job at restoring the engine a little bit. She's moving, she moves the boat. Gasoline engine though, raw water cool. These are the, um, the negatives about this engine in my opinion, but also it works. It's a working engine. Foot pump for water. I think all other pumps are barbaric because you have to touch them with your hands, which just transfers more bacteria. The head has the same foot pump. The woodwork has been the same since the 1970s. The chain plates were more recently redone. Our CNC24 had aluminum chain plates and apparently this one did as well. And they removed those aluminum chain plates and replaced them with these stainless steel ones. Helm, wheel steering. There is of course that trusty old spot to put a tiller in, an, in the case of an emergency if the wheel steering isn't working. Engine is working and so are all the dials. She has the lovely CNC shape and rod rigging. I also find it interesting that the mast goes through the deck. Fascinating. Jean, who is our patron and boat parts fixer, is proud of his boat and dinghy upgrades. Carmela's out, Sweet Pea's still in, and now we're up to Alita Fox, a Fria 39. Very nice boat. He gave me an extensive nautical tour of the Bay Area by dinghy. This is the realm from which our dear Rosa vessel came from. Shallow, silty, windswept marinas, struggling to stay in operation with the high costs of dredging. Art, art. Marina's auctioning off old boats that need ambitious new owners that have time, enough money, and the strength to see their projects through. We continued on our tour, heading towards the downtown core of San Francisco, where some older bay boat history resides. The modern section of the crane, where they used to build the more modern Navy ships. And I think in the like, 1970s, somewhere around there, they continually build ships here. Uh, then they closed it down. We're going to go over in a few minutes to another section. It was in the 1800s, they were still building ships. So the story is that in this area right here, they built ships continually for over 100 years. And we'll give you a little view of that. 
This area also had its high point and decline. So over here is the old building built back in the 1800s ish, 18, I think 80 or so. They used to build ships here. You can see over here those little white things. It's a post with a white thing coming up. Those are the things that used to winch in. They'd have these sticks on it. They'd spin it and they would winch in the old ships that they built. Over here, this wooden building. That's the, uh, is this silversmith or coppersmith? I think that's where they made all the metal items like that. This is the 1800s on the left. On the right is the 1900s, the more modern stuff. It's basically where they built boats for San, South San Francisco for over 100 years until the Navy pulled out and here it is. The city doesn't know what to do with the property. It's gorgeous waterfront property that's just sitting here in <laughs> yeah. disuse. What really catches my eye in the bay are all the structures that look like they were the inspiration for Star Wars buildings and ship designs. We took in the maritime view of the stadium, the old car ferry before the Bay Bridge was built to cross. and a miscellany of urban freeway environments sprinkled with a little bit of wildlife. Downtown, nearing the widening and the opening to the Pacific Ocean, it started to get rough for the little dinghy. But we bounced along over the waves and found a little bit of shelter behind Alcatraz Island. Anyways, these guys were out here rowing, so it wasn't all that rough. It's exactly the same as Arissa. Scooter. Back at Little Joie. So we had our first chafe, and then pull it up a couple of days later, I found a second chafe spot in the anchor line in a completely different area of the rope. So we came here with some cobbled together pieces of chain because the rope was just not doing it. Not ideal, but that's what you do in Richardson Bay. <laughs> if you can't tie a knot, tie a lot. Now that I have the boat more or less anchored with chain, I'm just trying to figure out my ride to shore. There are marinas nearby with dinghy docks, the closest one being Clipper, but they monitor their dinghy dock pretty aggressively they kick you out after about two hours. So my best bet is going to be bringing the kayak ashore. More help from sailing friends. Marlo works at the rigging shop where we'll be having our new rigging made again. And he's just the guy for do-it-yourself type projects using old parts from sailboats. The rigging shop had some scrap aluminum, specifically foils from old furlers to be recycled, which were perfect for constructing a very straightforward kayak cart. I picked up two plastic wheels from Harbor Freight that cannot puncture or rust, but we would have to concentrate on constructing a good bearing system. This is what I've been using to drag the, the kayak. It's been working, it just makes a horrendous noise. How loud? The skateboard is <laughs> Foils, or extrusions for sailboat furlers, are perfect because they're light and sturdy, but have a tiny bit of flex for dealing with the kayak on top bouncing around. So Marlo got to work on the trusty portaban and cut the bearings and bushings to size. And they're gonna go deep enough to stop this from spinning. Okay, you're gonna screw two screws exactly. in there. Next, we would need to screw everything together. That's some fancy ass stuff right there. I helped by applying my fine arts degree skills. Look at these little eyeballs. With some very careful cuts, the components for each side were looking more or less symmetrical. The bolts, our axles in this case, would need to become part of the frame. They would need to become stationary while the wheel rotates around them. Now, you could just glue or epoxy the bolts into place, 
But we're dealing with an expert fabricator here, and glue would just not do. That's going to help stop that rotation. Mm -hmm. Instead, we're using screws, drilled and tapped into place. Squared up to drill the next hole. And I was just gonna super glue that thing in there. The reason we drill and tap is to have positive mechanical fastening. It's stronger than a rivet, easier to extract. It also gives me the ability to isolate dissimilar metals. This is stainless on aluminum. This is where we have to have some sort of isolation. This is key. So you're gonna lana coat it all up. Yep. And I want a thin film. I don't wanna I don't want a ball. I just want a thin. Yeah, it smells a little cowy. Is it actually made of something cowish? Why is it smelling like cows? It's made out of dinosaurs, <laughs> maybe ancient cows, but Yeah, okay, that explains it. I kind of don't believe that that thin application of a grease would stop corrosion at all. Do the dip, 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 dip. Slop on some cow patty. But spoilers, the Lana coat would work quite well. It was a matter now of adjusting the wheel tightness just right. and sliding on some pool noodle to act as padding and grip for the kayak hull. Then voila! You can enjoy your paddle on the water and your wheeling on the land. Finally, the weather I was expecting. What internally is my impression of the natural state of this anchorage. Wind and fog rolling over and down the hills from the west, from the open sea. Even though the seals don't seem to make much of it, these are primo dragging conditions, and my anchor still wasn't set up quite right. A good length of chain and anchor from my friend, but I still needed to attach the chain to the deck properly and then my bridles, or snubbers, to the chain. After a day or two, the wind finally let up for what everyone knew was just a short while, though. A lot of people dragged yesterday, ended up all the way across the bay on the other side. And then this guy decided to come drop his anchor right where I've dropped my anchor. I wouldn't be surprised if he's on my anchor, that's where I dropped it. He's got his generator going, I can go up to his boat and start trying to talk to him or her but um, yeah my belief is that if somebody drops their anchor right on your anchor so the best possible course of action if you have the time is to then pick up your anchor and anchor right in front of them I promptly found out that I was stuck in the mud at low tide though calmed down a bit and chilled out sometime later my neighbor went out and found a better spot to ride out the rest of the weather I also got a hold of a snubber hook and a small enough shackle to bring the chain up onto the bow. The chain is shackled to an eye on the deck. That's the best connection we're going to get to the bow of the boat. I've got an extra dock line tied around inside some of the chain and the shackle, and that's connected to the deck. Then I have my two, two lines on either side making a bridle. And then that's hooked to the chain with kind of a cruddyish hook. But unfortunately, some other boats didn't make it through the blow. Some gentlemen worked hard for several days at low tide to pump the water out from this beautiful wooden vessel. But she was too far gone. Another casualty of tough times out here on the water.
there's absolutely no wind, let's go sailing. <laughs> 